Good day and welcome back to Commsverse. Well, we're kicking off day three with a session on analog to cloud, the challenge of enterprise migration to Microsoft Teams with John Stuart Murray. John, thanks for your time. Over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, James, and uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for turning up. This is my, my second session. I've got one more today at uh, three o'clock if you're interested on uh, um, all the sort of perils of hosting teams in the cloud. Um, so it will probably be a quite interesting session, if not uh, quite a short one. Uh, but this one is really on um, the kind of uh, some hints and tips, I guess, on, on our experience in getting enterprises uh, onto, onto teams. It's quite easy just to set up a direct routing um, set up. You, know, you can do it in about an hour, start to finish installing an SBC and getting it connected and, and making phone calls, but the real challenges lie in, in the detail. Um, so, you know, things like uh, integrating analog telephone systems um, with uh, with Teams, uh, migrating PBXs to Teams and various other aspects. So I want to look at those today, really. So it's a kind of um, a smorgasbord of, um, of different uh, kind of bits and pieces uh, around Teams migration. So first of all, a very quick introduction to, to Audio Codes. I, I work for Audio Codes, by the way, as a technical uh, consultant uh, in the UK. Um, so yeah, we're going to look at first of all at analog integration with Teams direct routing and you know, how we get these old phones connected up to, to Teams and, and what other things we can do to, to make life easier. Uh, and we also talk about sort of small PBXs, but one of the key things that we're doing with some of our larger customers is migrating PBXs um, to Teams direct routing. Uh, and we just struck up a technology partnership with, an, with another company, which has given us a fantastic tool that helps Teams migration uh, of PBXs. And we'll look at that in, in a bit of detail. Uh, and then a couple of kind of smaller topics, um, adding a bit of artificial intelligence to, to Teams. So, you know, the cognitive services in the cloud are now starting to get real and get usable. Uh, and we've got an application and a gateway product that enables you to hook Teams into these kind of AI um, bots and cognitive services. So have a quick look at that. Uh, and one of the big topics about Teams is branch survivability. You know, we had a couple of big blow ups in Teams um, this year and, uh, and late last year, which caused a loss of service for some time. And people started to get really nervous about Teams and other cloud PBXs and whether they can handle the kind of workloads that we need and, and the resiliency that we need. So branch survivability is a key topic um, and it's happening soon. So I've got some kind of inside information on what's going on in, in branch survivability in Teams. And then a, a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions during the presentation, it's best if you could just type them into the Q&A, please. Uh, and either James, who's uh, our host today, will answer the questions uh, and then we'll read them out and, and talk about them um, later at the end. And also right at the end of this, we've got a breakout session, which you, um, James will post the link to. Um, so we can always drop into a breakout session and have a chat as well um, following this. OK, so straight on. Um, so a very quick introduction to, to audio codes. Uh, we've been around for quite some time now, 26 years as, uh, as Thames manufacturer. Um, there's, well, I think it's nearly 800 employees worldwide actually now, and we're, we're kind of growing uh, all the time. And a very strong focus on, on Microsoft solutions. So probably about 50% of our revenue is attached to solutions that go into, into Microsoft. So it's, it used to be Skype and uh, Office uh, OCS and stuff like that, but now it's uh, Teams really. We also work with lots of other people like Genesis and other contact center vendors and, and uh, you know, Broadsoft, all those other big platforms, but Microsoft is a significant part of our world. Um, we always kind of operate through systems integrators and uh, value, to, uh, value add distribution and service providers. So we don't sell directly to, to end customers. Uh, it's always through kind of a, a significant partnership we have, which really adds value to the whole solution set. And we like to think of ourselves, I guess, as, as a trusted advisor for telecoms. You know, the sort of telecoms is, is an old business and, uh, you know, if people that know about it are gradually fading away. Um, so, but we've got a lot of old people in our company, so we know how to use these old telephone systems. So our job really is to help you and your customers, you know, get these telephone systems up and running and, uh, and working with Teams straight routing. And to do that, we've got a huge um, range of products. Let me just get a, a quick pointer up if I can. Uh, here we go. Um, so you can see sort of you know, down the bottom, Get a good color. Um, down the bottom, we've got um, these kind of gateways and SPCs and analog terminal adapters like these that you probably know audio codes for. Uh, we've got hundreds of these of different sizes. You know, they look very much the same. It's kind of little to large, essentially. And also software SPCs. You know, we uh, we used to do all hardware, but now probably 70 to 80 percent of our sales is in uh, software SPCs, whether it's in Azure or VMware or um, uh, Amazon AWS. The software is, is clearly the way to go for, for SPCs. And we do big capacity. You know, we can run SPCs 
that run 70, 80,000 sessions in the cloud. So that's you know huge capacity. We also make a range of, of hardware devices. So we make uh, you know Skype and Teams native phones um, and starting to do more and more in the meeting room area. So we've got kind of small audio conferencing solutions now from a partnership with Dolby and we're just about to release a, a collab bar. You know, that's kind of video bars that sit on top of a, a TV. Typically you see enabling a TV basically that's coming out very soon. And also um, a wide range of kind of software and applications that sit above all this stuff. Um, so we have things like our, our One Voice Operations Center that manages the SBCs, uh, UMP, which you can use for managing user migration. And also we have a call recording application, SmartTap. Um, we, we just had a presentation this morning about a couple of hours ago uh, on that, um, where we announced our kind of support for the team's peer-to-peer -peer, um, call recording, as well as the normal peer-to-peer -peer call recording that we already do. So if you're interested in call recording, then just, just ping us. Anyway, that's enough about uh, all the other stuff we do. And we're kind of um, here to talk about uh, other bits and pieces, basically. So just a very quick overview of Teams Direct Routing, just so we're positioning what we're talking about. Um, there's two different kind of models for Teams Direct Routing. Um, you know, typically, as a, uh, a small to large enterprise, you'll have your own SBC here, which kind of connects you, um, you know, to a SIP trunk down here and to Teams up here. And this is what we call the enterprise model, where the SBC belongs to one enterprise and they use it. So whether the, the SBC is in a hosted data center or whether it's on on premise somewhere, it belongs to a single SBC, a uh, single enterprise, and they, they use it for their own uh, uses. But the other method we're seeing is, is is probably much more common. In fact, is that Teams is actually being designed to support multi-tenant um, uh, applications. So we can run essentially the same SBC, um, but this time it would be run perhaps perhaps by a service provider or a systems integrator, and they're basically partitioning the SBC and then providing Teams direct routing access for, for multiple customers. So this is a, a customer down here that's kind of using the SBC for Teams, and this is another completely separate customer that's using the same SBC um, for Teams direct routing um, as well through here, basically, um, and up through here. So this is the multi-tenant SBC. So that's the two different kind of models of Teams direct routing. And it doesn't matter which model we do, all the stuff we're going to talk about now um, still applies to that. So that's Teams Direct Routing. So let's have a look in a bit more detail about how we connect analog devices up to, to Teams. So um, analog is often forgotten, uh, essentially, and analog, analog can be really important. So these can be kind of lift phones, security phones, and things like ruggedized phones. So you might have a large industrial plant where you've got kind of like, you know, big chunky phones that are sticking on the wall for people to make phone calls with. Uh, and you can't use the normal kind of really expensive native Teams phones because they're 300 quid each and, uh, you know, can break very easily. You've also got decked phones that you might want to integrate uh, into Teams. And then, of course, you've got the old fax machines uh, and modems. And often you have these phone extensions that may not need a full Teams license. You know, I mean, Teams isn't cheap and you don't, don't have to have a Teams license for every single phone that you have. So there's other ways of integrating, um, you know, uh, telephony with, uh, with Teams. And analog is often forgotten until the last moment, or in fact, even after the last moment. You know, I've been involved in, in many different Teams installations where people have completely forgotten about like, a couple of phones that were doing various things like door entry systems and stuff like that. And it's only after they turn the PBX off and turn Teams on that they realize they couldn't get in the door or they couldn't send faxes. So it's worth sort of thinking about Teams um, telephony and planning it. And we'll look at that in more detail in the PBX migration um, phase later on. But it applies to all sizes, little and large. You know, don't forget about analog. It's, uh, it's obviously very important. So how do we con um, uh, you know, connect analog devices to, to Teams direct routing? Well, the first thing we need, um, obviously, is we've got to turn these analog telephones into voice over IP. And what we do for that is to have one of these things called uh, an ATA or analog terminal adapter. So lots of people make them. We, we make them. Lots of other people make them as well. People like Grandstream and stuff do them. And essentially their job is, um, you know, they have a bunch of what we call FXS ports in, in the back of the ATA. So an FXS is the foreign exchange subscriber port, it's called. And that's the port that you plug a telephone system, a uh, telephone into, basically. And that just converts it to, to voice over IP um, so that you can then connect it to, to something else. Um, the other way we can do it also is that sometimes our hardware SPCs and gateways actually have these FXS ports in the back. So we have kind of either four or eight or 12 ports in the back of our, our ga uh, gateways and SPCs, and you can plug telephones directly um, into the back of them. And then of course they're converted to VoIP out of here. 
So once they are converted to Azure, we do have a variety of different ATAs. So we do kind of little two port ones like this one here, right up to 288 um, port um, uh, ATAs. And they might be used in a hotel, for example, where you had to have a, like a phone system in every bedroom, um, or it might be a large industrial plant where you've got phones, you know, hundreds of phones scattered throughout the plant. And you can concentrate those in, in, into up to 288 um, ports. So it's a, it's a fairly high capacity. Uh, and what's important also is that we support analog line lengths up to seven, seven kilometers. So that's really long reach analog. Um, you need the correct wiring to do that, of course. It's got to be well shielded and the right size. Um, but it means, again, like a large industrial plant, you can easily run cable you know, right across from one side of a, a plant to the other and, and aggregate them or concentrate them into, into a single ATA. So once you've got them kind of uh, got this in, into VoIP, um, the next thing you need to do basically is connect it into uh, an SBC. So there's been quite a big change. A couple of months ago, um, Microsoft announced they would now support analog connections as long as they're using an approved ATA connecting through uh, a direct routing certified SBC. So you need to have two things approved here. You need to have the, uh, the ATA being approved by Microsoft and then the SBC being a direct routing certified SBC. So it's two parts of the solution to make it approved by, by Microsoft. But it's a great step forward because up until then, you know, Microsoft had really kind of ignored analog telephones and we used to connect them up like this anyway, but it's a little bit kind of under the covers. And, uh, you know, if ever, anything ever went wrong, you know, Microsoft wouldn't always stand behind you, but, but now they do. As long as we do it in this way, it's a fully supported and fully approved connection type. So what we do essentially is we register the, the ATA with the SBC and we're going to look at that in a bit more detail in, in a second. But essentially the SBC is then configured with the appropriate dial plans and, uh, and phone routes so that you can set up all these different call directions. So you can mean that analog telephones can call other analog telephones that might be on site. So if you've got another analog telephone here, you can call that phone. But also the analog telephone can call out to the SIP trunk and out to the outside world. Uh, and also the analog telephone can call any of their Teams colleagues. So if you might have a Teams colleague here, you can talk to them quite happily and uh, you know, exchange phone calls. And this is very useful during the migration phase because you can set up these um, the dial plans and the normalizations etc so that people can make the telephone calls they're used to you know if you're used to calling your colleague on extension 456 um, you know, if your colleagues being migrated to teams you still want to call them on 456 you don't want to have to think how to do it basically so what we can do inside the SBC is set up the appropriate dial plans and, and numbered normalizations so when the phone call comes in from 456 here we can do a lookup in Active Directory or a lookup somewhere else and then convert that number to the the team's kind of full DDI and make Make sure it goes to the right person. So 456 goes to you know, plus 441252 etc and gets to the right person and uh, and vice versa. So that's a really important part of you know integrating telephones into uh, into a team's migration phase is you you make you do the extra mile to make sure that you do these kind of dial plans because it makes life so much better for, for the users. What you can also do is do things like you know, create contact objects in Active Directory um, and asso associate a telephone number with them. So, for example, you could have sort of lift phone um, is extension 3281 so that people can actually find these telephones as well in AD, which makes dialing much easier uh, if you know what the telephone number is. So it's the kind of details which really make life much easier. So that's the kind of basic installation of an analog telephone with uh, with Teams direct routing. Um, what you can also do to enhance this is, is use the feature that we talked about, this uh, registration feature on the SPCs, to actually add some extra functionality to the uh, to the whole thing. Because not all team not all phones need a Teams license. You know, I mean, as I said earlier on, Teams can be fairly expensive. If you've got hundreds of extensions, um, like for example, I'm working on a major project at the moment, which is a, a global mining organisation, and they've got um, you know about 300 sites worldwide, and each of these sites has got about um, 100 to 200 rooms in, in the mines and they just need a cheap analog telephone in each room. They don't need these guys to have Teams licenses. Um, but So what we're doing there essentially is using the SIP registrar feature inside our SBCs so we can support all these connections. So we can use a mixture of analog telephones but we can also use SIP telephones all kind of registering um, up with the SBC. So these will register with the SBC, both analog phones and SIP phones and also decked phones as well because most decked phones have a, a base station that produces voice over IP. So we can hook decked phones in exactly the same way into the SBC. So we run the registrar software on the SBC and that enables basically what we call a mini PBX feature. 
so that all these phones can then call each other quite happily. And we can do things like call transfer. We can do music on hold because the SPC can store music on hold files or can pull them in from somewhere else. So people can have completely normal telephony in a kind of small PBX um, functionality. And that's also then obviously connected up to Teams as well. So all the Teams people can interact with this. So you get a kind of complete solution set, you know, where you're incorporating analog phones, SIP phones, DECT phones and Teams clients all in the, um, all in the same feature. So it gives you the kind of right size deployment flexibility um, that, that you really need essentially. So that's kind of analog phone um, integration as it is now. Um, but, but Microsoft is all work, also working on kind of enhancing this functionality. So this is kind of roadmap items, so it isn't necessarily guaranteed to come out from Microsoft, but they are looking at enhancing this functionality. So one of the things they want to do is, is actually make analog objects um, a kind of a real object in, inside Teams. And this, of course, means there'll probably be an associated license, but you don't get something for nothing, essentially. But that gives the ability to do things like um, presence information. So when the phone goes off hook and starts making phone calls, um, you get presence information coming through so people know, know you're on the phone and things like message waiting and indication which we support on, on our ATAs um, is, is hopefully going to be supported as well you know sometime in 2020. Obviously lots of roadmaps have changed because the recent situation that we're all in but, uh, but yeah hopefully this is being enhanced and more and more analog functionality will come along um, in the future. So that's the kind of you know the initial look at how we sort of do analog um, phone integration and PBX integration. But there are kind of other PBXs, as I talked about earlier on, and many of our customers are, are you know, large customers that have you know, big PBXs with thousands of users on them and even networks of PBXs. So you might have you know, PBX in London, one in Manchester, one in Paris, one in Berlin, and they're all kind of linked together uh, and, and joined up together. And trying to migrate thousands of users that are on PBXs up to Teams is a really intimidating and, uh, and challenging task. Um, and what it can do, um, you know, is give lots of sort of technical challenges, lots of difficulties. Um, so what we've done is we've we've struck up a collaboration with a company called Univonix, um, and we've kind of done, um, worked on this uh, this product together, and we're going to um, sell it, be selling it together. And essentially, this product enables us to to sort of overcome the challenge of, of PBX migration. So if you look at the difficulties that, that arise. You know, the first one is that we have huge amounts of data to, to go through because we've got you know, thousands of users, lots of dialing plans, lots of dialing features. There might be sort of hunt group sets. There might be night lines, all that kind of thing. Um, and all the different pre preferences they have about call forwarding and stuff. All that data is stored inside the PBXs. And of course, you might have multiple sites and PBXs from different vendors scattered across, you know, across the world. So there's huge amounts of data to, to gather and, and, and process. You then need to check the feature parity. So if you're migrating to Teams, you know, is, hunt, is a hunt group on a PBX exactly the same as a hunt group in Teams? Is, is it supported in the same way? Um, you know, if, if you want to do call forwarding on Busy, is that supported in, in Teams, for example? So lots of things that may not be possible in the PBX um, in, in Teams, but there may be features in Teams which are very similar. So with a bit of intelligence and understanding, you can, you can migrate these features across um, you know, effectively. But all this potentially leads to kind of a real a huge amount of manual labor. I'm trying to go through these. You know, people need to understand how a PBX works. So if you're looking at a bigger via PBX, you need to be really experienced in, in a via to understand what exactly has been implemented in the via PBX and then work out how to migrate that across. So it's a really time consuming and difficult um, process, uh, causing long, long implementation and sometimes even stopping implementation uh, essentially. So what you really need is, um, you know, kind of a migration strategy to get around this, uh, uh, this, this these kind of issues, essentially, because these challenges can really slow down or even completely halt a migration to Teams. You know, I, I've seen a couple of instances where customers just decided they just couldn't migrate to Teams because it was just too difficult. It would need like a two or three year sort of um, delay, essentially, while they slowly process their way through this. I mean, they'll, they'll do it at the end, but it just takes a long time to, to do it, which really slows down everything that we're trying to do. So as I said, what we've done is we've we've teamed up with a company called Univonix, which has been doing this for some time now, uh, to, to provide this kind of PBX uh, migration um, product. So this is how it looks like um, in action, essentially. So what we've got is over here we have, you know, your legacy PBX and uh, over here we have Teams. And this is the kind of the Univonix migration suite. So this is a, a software solution. It's a cloud based solution. Um, so you can use it anywhere in the world <coughs> and it's always available uh, as, as you'd expect nowadays. And the way it works essentially is that you you start off by doing the, the, the PBX data extraction and, and the source assessment. So the data is taken from the source PBX, put into the migration suite, and obviously the team's telephony data is, is fed in um, at the same time.
And then you build your configuration plan and plan validation. So it goes through these processes of working out exactly how it can migrate all the features from, from one to the other. And then you go through the kind of approval process and, and validation process. And then you go through the actual migration process where you're provisioning teams, but also provisioning the PBX. You know, what's key is as you move people off the PBX, you've got to sort of deprovision them and move them into teams. You can't just leave them floating in, in, uh, in the PBX, otherwise they'll still be getting phone calls to dead, uh, dead extensions. So that feature is often for gotten about you've got to take people off the pbx and put them into teams and that's another key thing that the, this tool does is it'll take them away and, and move them across essentially so it's part of the whole suite essentially what's really nice about this is that there's a couple of different layers of, of implementation um, with the Uniphonix tool and, and the first one is this pbx assessment tool now this can actually be used as, as a pre-sales activity so you can actually use this to, to give to customers as, as a free service essentially so if you're starting talking to, to a large customer um, we can run this pbx assessment um, on their pbx so we just need the data to, the data file from their pbx essentially and it does this this really detailed assessment and i'll, I'll show you a report in a couple of minutes on, on what it looks like but it gives you the kind of real you know how many extensions they have what the extensions are doing what call plans are available you know, what hunt groups etc are available so really Powerful kind of feature set, and it's a really value-added sort of piece of um, uh, 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 white paper, I guess, that, that you give to a customer that gives them something of, of real value for the for the pre-sales engagement. So it's, it's quite a useful thing to, to give people as part of the sales process. Uh, and that leads then to the, the full kind of implementation where you know when, when you uh, when you when you win the project as it were so you go through the pbx analyzer as we've said through the planner and then the migration phase and then um, that, that brings out um, you know, th this assessment tool so just to show you what the assessment analysis um, looks like so this is just a snapshot from analysis we recently did for a very very large American company. So they had several PBXs, um, one of which was an Avaya PBX, you can see with three and a half thousand or 3,179 users, lots of analog phones as we talked about. And it gives you this really nice snapshot, first of all, of a kind of feature parity. So you can see that you know we've got 9% green kind of thing where just everything moves across easily. 76% um, you know, is, uh, is amber, where it's a partial feature parity, and 15% is that the tool detected no feature parity or manual manual review was required essentially so you get a great snapshot straight away of you know how many problems you're going to have and where you need to focus your attention uh, and effort it also gives you a really detailed breakdown so you can see you know, analog phones are here you know you can't naturally move analog telephones as we've discussed to teams you might need to use a you know an SPC of some kind as we discussed so the tool tells you that and brings that uh, information out and then it shows you things like uh, you know, the hunt group parity, for example, so how you move a hunt group uh, and the feature parity you have in your hunt groups. So really high value information that you're getting from this, this PBX assessment uh, analysis. And it really does kind of unlock and enhance migration. So we support many different PBXs. So there's Cisco, Avaya, Nortel, Mitel, Siemens, Unify. So these are the kind of key enterprise PBXs that you'll see out there. And I think other ones are being added uh, as time goes by. But you know, this is this is 90% of large enterprises uh, are kind of built into there basically. And the target cloud is is Teams in, in the conversation we're having today, but also it can migrate to Skype for Business and also looking at other PBX or cloud PBXs uh, in the future as well. So that's the kind of uh, the, the new Uniphonix um, uh, tool we have, as I said. Uh, it's a great collaboration with, with a great company. If you need any more information, then please ping me about it um, afterwards. OK, so we're sort of running out of time now, but I just want to touch briefly on, on two final topics, which is branch survivability and then a bit of artif artificial intelligence. So branch survivability is, is possible um, now. Um, so we do have um, this product called the, the One Voice Resiliency, um, which is a license feature um, essentially on our RSBCs, which is OVR feature. Um, this enables you to um, essentially register um, phones and these are audio codes phones. It doesn't work with other people's phones and um, we weren't really allowed to do it with other people's phones. But if you're using audio codes phones, um, you can um, run them through this um, One Voice Resiliency feature in RSBC and they basically register with the SBC and then through register up to Teams up here so everything works completely normally while teams is up and running but um, if you have a break in the connection to teams so something goes wrong your teams goes down or your internet connection goes down for example then essentially the registrations fall back um, onto the SBC with this uh, this OVR license so all these telephone calls these telephones can now make calls to each other 
and they can make calls out to the um, the SIP trunk and out to the outside world and obviously inbound calls work as well. So you don't have IM and presence working, obviously, you've just got the phones working basically, but it's key to have you know certain phones working um, at certain times. And what's really nice is it's, it's, it's very interactive. So it puts up a display on the phone um, saying limited services available, that only phone calls can be made. So the users don't have to do anything. They don't need to reboot the phones or change the phone profile. They get a message on the phone saying limited service and they just make phone calls you know, as normal essentially because all the dial plans work as you'd expect. And then when everything comes back, uh, and, and Teams comes back up again, then everything switches over, a message comes up on the phones and they say, you know, you're okay to go and off you go again. So this is a current audio code solution, this, this One Voice Resiliency license, which is just a license that runs on our SPCs. Um, but as I said, there is a, a downside to this. It's only supported by our phones you know, running in, in, in this 3PIP mode. So what's actually happening? And this is a roadmap item from Microsoft. So this is kind of information that you may not have heard before, so don't publish it too widely, but uh, it's on its way. But essentially Microsoft are producing what's titled at the moment the HTTP proxy. It'll probably have a, a whizzy um, title, I'm sure, at the end of it. But it's a bit like the old SBA functionality we used to have, where you've got this kind of HTTP proxy, which runs um, uh, in a bit of software and essentially downloads the site dial plan and configuration from Office 365 teams. So it pulls all the information down into um, this uh, this kind of application essentially. Now we're running the application on our, our um, sort of PC module we have that runs on our SPCs and gateways. So Microsoft aren't going to be giving this HTTP proxy to anyone. It's only going to go to technology partners because they want to make sure they control the environment that it runs in. So as I said, we're running it in, uh, in the hardware modules we have in our SPCs. We're also going to run it in a kind of virtual machine instance for our software SPCs. So if you've got one of our virtual, virtual software SPCs, there'll be a kind of packaged VM instance which will run this uh, this HTTP proxy application as well so it can provide support um, from, from software solutions as well. So this has got a wider scope than the, the, the application we have. This supports all of the team's clients and phones as well. So if you've got your Windows client or your web-based client or your Mac client or, or a team's native IP phone, these will work sort of normally and it works in roughly the same way as our product works. You know, they kind of register through the proxy up into Teams and if a call fails, it routes to the backup SIP trunk and, and ISDN. So I don't yet know whether we're going to have IAM in presence with this. I think it might just be phone calls. Um, so it won't be quite the full SBA functionality, but it, you can make phone calls and that's what really matters uh, in these environments. We're actually going into TAP right now. So I've got two or three customers in the UK that are going into TAP with this in, in the next week or so. Um, so TAP now means kind of GA probably sometime in autumn. So it's going to be you know, not, not too long now before we have this. And it's really been needed for Microsoft. It's, you know, site survivability is, is a key part of a kind of enterprise telephony solution. Um, so it's good to see that it's, it's, uh, it's finally happening. And I think we should be able to upgrade existing SBA devices. You know, if you've got one of our old SBAs in the field uh, and it's got one of the reasonably modern uh, OSN modules, then well, there should be an upgrade path. You know, we haven't gone into detail about how we do this yet, but it's pretty likely we can offer an upgrade to them as well. So you can take the same kind of functionality in Skype and put it into Teams, basically. So that's site resiliency. There is one final other way of doing site resiliency, which is using things like SD-WAN. So this is a, a big topic. I'm not going to cover it now, of course, but uh, just to let you know that we do have, again, we have our SBCs and gateways that have this kind of PC module um, built inside them. Uh, and we have relationships with a couple of SD-WAN um, vendors so that we can run the SD-WAN software on this module here. And that then allows you to provide site resiliency because we can run, um, you know, we've got a, a small SIM card in the back of these, so we can have a 4G backup on here, or we can have a SIP trunk backup going down a diverse route. And this SD-WAN software sits there monitoring the, the traffic up to the, the main connection. And if it fails over, it switches the traffic directly back, you know, out through the SIM card um, or um, kind of off, off down a separate S uh, SIP trunk. And I've used this and it works fantastically. You, you can be having a phone conversation in Teams and just pull out the ethernet cable that connects to the internet and then the phone phone call switches straight over to 4G and you can't hear a thing. You, know, you just carry on talking completely normally, no, no um, interruption at all, but you're running now on 4G. It's a fantastic solution set. So just to let you know, we have that available if you're interested in it. OK, so the final thing I want to talk about really is um, adding some intelligence to, uh, to Teams. So there's, there's two ways we do this really. Um, all of our SBCs have got a REST API interface now. I don't know if people are aware of this, but we're not just a kind of dumb SBC essentially. There's actually a full programming API interface now where you can you can do things with them. 
And it means that applications have now got access to kind of management, monitoring and, and call control um, on the uh, uh, on the SBCs, which lets you integrate the SBC with, with kind of unlimited applications effectively. So what you could do, for example, is, you know, if you're using, I don't know if anyone's used Microsoft Flow here, but it's a, it's a great tool, quite fun to play with, where you can hook in lots of different things. So you can connect Office to a text provider, or you can connect um, you know, Twitter to Slack or something like that, just by using Microsoft Flow with kind of drag and drop um, GUI. Uh, and you can use this with, with our SBCs as well, because you know, Flow works with, with REST APIs. So as a typical example, um, you could you could set up an application in Flow so that if a user dials um, 999, then the SPC will send some information to this Flow application saying that you know John's dialed 999. Um, so then you can then make Flow send an email off to site security or send a, an alert of some kind to site security so they know what's going on. So those kind of integrations that you can do. Or you can do sort of monitoring things. If the SPC reaches 90% capacity, you can then send a text message out um, you know, some, somewhere to let people know what's going on. So this, you can start to add value to kind of SPC solutions. So you're not just dropping an SPC, you know, in a, in a data center and saying, here's your team's direct routing. You can kind of, you know, hook it into other applications and, and call flows as well, which is a really important part of your, your job process. But the other way is maybe slightly more exciting is, uh, is the voice AI gateway we have. So the voice AI gateway is, is kind of an extension of the WebRTC gateway we have that runs on our SPCs, and we're currently making this uh, available as, as a service. And what the voice AI gateway does is it basically connects to these new cognitive services that are running in, in the cloud. So you know, Microsoft have got the Azure bot kind of APIs, the Azure framework uh, sort of, uh, running up here, where you can do things like um, you know text to speech, um, language translation, speech to text, all those kind of things. And Google have exactly the same thing with their dialog flow and uh, their cloud text-to-speech and speech-to-text APIs and there's other stuff up here in AWS as well there's lots of APIs available in AWS to do the same kind of thing so all these APIs are up here but it's quite hard to know how to integrate um, directly with them because there's not a native way of getting telephone calls um, into them because over on the left hand side we've got the kind of world that we're in I guess essentially where you know you might have a contact center or you've got PBXs you've got SIP trunks it's all the world of SIP and, and all the the other stuff that we're used to and the, the trick is to work out how to connect it across um, to to these new bot APIs and that's what the voice AI gateway is for as I said essentially it sits in the middle and basically takes some um, telephone calls and SIP um, calls on one side and it converts it to the kind of HTTP streaming and the kind of voice uh, API that um, the, uh, voice APIs that you need to integrate with these bots so you know you can get a phone call coming in here we can send it off to do um, speech to text and then we can then send that text to a, to a bot inside here and the bot can read the text and do something intelligent so it could be someone reading up to, to a contact center for example and wanted to, to ask a question and you can then look up the question get some data convert it back to speech and then send it back down the telephone call back down here so it's a really powerful way of integrating the old world um, with, with the new so how it works with teams you, know, you can obviously spin off a call for some reason in teams send it off to the voice AI gateway send it off to the, the bot framework do something smart and then send the voice data back again and off to the person that's speaking on the phone so let's you do things like you know maybe a smart assistant or on the fly language translation you can translate you know french to english on the fly or something you know lots of really interesting things that you can do uh, with the spcs so it's not just about you know telephone calls essentially that's really all I wanted to, to talk about essentially. Um, so just to summarize, you know, analog devices are important. You know, don't forget about them is a key thing and they can be easily integrated into Teams deployments and really giving value adds to Teams deployments if you use that kind of mini PBX features that we have in, in the SBC. And then we had we we looked in detail about the Univonix uh, relationship we now have with the, with PBX migration because that can really stop a, a team's deployment in its tracks or really delay it. So having a tool like the, um, the Univonix tool really helps you add value to the pre-sales engagement. You know that that assessment report, which you know could be free of charge, really gives something you can take to a customer and and uh, you know, let them show that you know what you're talking about and you, you can really understand their problems and can add value to getting rid of any problems and, and having a significantly uh, easy more easily migration. Uh, more timely migration and then we had a quite look at site, site, site survivability sorry it's uh, it's coming coming soon as well which is which is great news and then you know, cognitive services you know to look at the future it's a good place to go okay um, so that's about it um, from me we've got um, you know, five or ten minutes left for Q&A if there are any questions so just to let you know that if you want to speak to us just ping us at uh, UKSales at audiocos.com or you could look me up on LinkedIn or something and I'm on there uh, but yeah James I'll hand back to you now if there's any uh, questions please
that's okay. We've had a few, uh, and I've tried to address the ones that I can. Um, so the first first question we'll probably tackle is uh, Francois was asking, uh, what about facts? Um, now I've briefly answered my opinion, but I'd like to hear yours. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so, so so facts isn't supported in teams uh, at all, essentially. So, but it is supported in, in the gateways and SBCs. So it works fine. The, the, the trick really is to to make sure you work with a SIP trunk provider that supports facts, uh, because you know we can easily connect a fax machine to an ATA and then into the SBC. Uh, that's quite easy. And you know the, the audio codes SBCs and other people's SBCs tend to do facts fairly well. You know we've been doing it for a long time now. We you know typically convert it to T38, which gives you the best experience. Mm. Uh, but you can. Do, you can do voice band data as well, but the, the trick I found is, is to work with a SIP trunk provider that does actually support facts because some do and some don't, and some don't know they do, and, and some do that do know they do. So speak to them first. Um, and the other thing to understand is that you will not get the same reliability that you get with with the TDM based facts. You know, TDM facts you get you know 100% reliability effectively. Mm -hmm. um, facts over IP it's going to be 98% if you're lucky. So you will get more facts failures, but you know facts retries. So it's not usually a problem, but just be aware of that beforehand because it doesn't always work it doesn't ever work as well as it does with pure psdn so yeah hopefully your answer was something like that or don't you add anything no, I, I, was, I was i was basically just trying to say trying to keep it out of, of uh teams but yes uh, I, I do the same sort of thing i'll try and convert it to t38 and send it across the wan as t38 if i've ever got it uh but things to keep in mind if you ever do do faxing over ip uh, t38 will limit you to 14.4 kilobits instead of 33 sticks um, so your factors will go a little bit slower, and and yeah, as um, as John said, that reliability does go down. Um, Facts is a finicky beast. Um, I typically, in ninety nine percent of cases, I just fuck, send it off to another provider. I get an external fax carrier and I just yeah. don't make it my problem it's somebody else's problem <laughs> exactly yeah yeah yeah. yeah it is yeah, but I guess I think my, my one piece of advice would be it doesn't work as well as PSTM based fax so just if you're aware of that beforehand you can make it work mm. um, successfully but just don't try and oversell it because uh, there will be difficulties so yeah 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 for sure um and and realistically it's 2020 um yeah <laughs> 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 Leave it behind. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Kevin Richer asks, for large enterprises, would you recommend a separate SBC for analog slash normal SIP endpoints? For example, for management purposes, so when doing maintenance on numbers, you do not mess up central routing. It's a good question, actually, yeah, and it really depends on, on what you mean by large, I think. Um, you know, we can... Uh, if it was say 200 extensions, probably 100 extensions, you might want to think about having a separate SPC because you, you do tend to need quite large root tables and, and quite large number of manipulation rules and stuff. If it's mm -hmm. four or five lines, 10 lines, then definitely it's all okay on the same SPC. So, you know, maybe around 20 to 30 lines, I would think about putting an, S an extra SPC in there um, because it starts to get complicated and, and you don't want to pollute what you're doing on, on the main SPC. You know, a, a lot of the SPCs I see have like a hundred plus routing rules in them and they're very hard to manage um, so if you add an extra kind of 50 analog rules as well it starts to get difficult especially if multiple people are doing it so say so yeah i would seriously consider it um, you know they're not expensive these small spcs you're talking about you know less than a thousand pounds so it doesn't really matter in in, in in the great scheme of things when you're doing a big migration um, so so yeah look at the numbers but around 20 ish to 50 ish i would think about having a separate spc definitely yeah, and, and look, uh, as I said, um, I, I like the MP124 purely because I can slide uh, the existing Cisco solutions out and slide the 124 in. Yeah, yeah. But because um, I'm lazy, I don't like cabling. Uh, but also, um, and, and completely outside the scope of this chat, but if, you, if you're going to start routing lots of analog stuff, um, look at leveraging some of the really smart um, bits in the SBC. You can have the SBC look at AD for your routing. And I've seen, um, I've seen some fantastic... Um, uh, implementations where people have set which SBC the uh, or oh, sorry which gateway that particular extension is sitting on using an AD object and mm -hmm. stuff like that routing accordingly so there's tons of stuff you can do there but well outside the scope of this talk it's very true. I mean, it's um, exactly because, like I said, if some people have 150 PBX uh, routing, uh, sorry, um, SBC routing rules, but often they could be squeezed down to two routing rules if you use things like the dial plan, because we've got mm. lots of automation inside the SBC where you can have you know lookup tables and stuff, and then you end up with one one or two routing rules rather than saying mm -hmm. like if the telephone number is one two three, then do this. If the telephone number is four five six, do this. You know, you mm -hmm. just have a dial plan where you have one two three and four five six in there, you know, doing different things. So, so yeah, have a look at what the SBC can do for you because usually they can simplify things enormously if you put a bit of work in it up front sort of thing as you as you said basically yeah 
yeah, yeah. Uh, so Francois was asking about local site DR voice survivability, and I think you answered that with the OVOC uh, slides, but uh, I'll let you elaborate. Uh, yeah, so as, as we talked about, so there's, there's there's two solution sets really. There's the OVR, the One Voice Resiliency, which is the you know, the, the current solution that we have. Um, you know, it's an audio code solution. There are other ones available, of course, uh, and that's the simple license on on the SPC or gateway. Um, and it, but the only downside is it only supports our own phones. So the audio codes, um, you know, the Skype phones essentially, they're running in three pip mode. Um, so it doesn't support native Teams phones. Doesn't support other vendors' phones uh, either. It has to be our phones. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the Microsoft solution is coming downstream, as we said, you know, it's available very soon. It's in tap now and that will support everyone's phone. So that's um, it's probably a better solution in the end. Um, but if you need something now, then you can use our solution and we can migrate you afterwards as well. So I'm doing a lot of migration at the moment with that kind of thing. So. Yeah, yeah. And a related question to that was uh, Kevin was also asking, does OVR uh, over SIP also work with redundant SBCs? It does, uh, yes. It's full. Yeah, sorry, Karen. No, I was going to say, I couldn't see any reason why not, but uh, I'd let you comment. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So if, if you talk about our, our HA, when, when we do HA, we have active passive SBCs. Um, mm. So so yeah, OVR works fine with that, basically, because the um, you know, the, the call, basically we're, we're changing the MAC address IP address relationship. So if the active SBC fails, the passive one takes over and it takes over the essentially the MAC address of the old one. So all, all the calls just route straight through. So you can have some issues with re-establishing TLS connections, um, which sometimes causes problems. But generally speaking, it works OK with uh, with uh, HASBCs, yeah. Mm. And in regards to your reporting uh, functionality, as as this, as this Mishra was asking, what kind of export do you need from the Avaya? Uh, it, is it just files that you output, or is it uh, do you need to give this tool access to the PBX to so it control it itself? Um, I'll actually have to defer to uh, to uh, the Univonics guys because I've not had that much experience with it yet. I, I believe um, you, you take a data dump from it essentially, so some sort of data file output from the PBX, which you then um, you, you put into the tool. Um, mm. But it, I think it might also, I, I thought I remember in the past, you could actually connect the tool to the PBX as well. Um, but I don't, if a guy asks the question wants to ping me, or maybe a girl asks the question wants to ping me, then I'll, I'll put you in touch with the right people and, and answer that question. But I think it's a data file definitely and possibly connection to the PBX as well. All right, and last one, Gwen Thomas was asking, that connection into flow sounds quite interesting. Do you have an example or guide of how that connection is configured? Uh, yes, we do. We've got a white paper um, which talk, talks you through how to, oh, it's an application note actually rather than white paper, which talks you through exactly how to do it. And I think it uses the example of the user dialing 999 uh, and then sending an email. Um, so if you um, either drop me an email um, or drop UK sales an email, and I'll, I'll get the email and just, just mention what you're looking for. Then I'll send you the uh, the application note back again. Sounds like one of Shane's um, scripts or something. <laughs> <laughs> it may well have been, I think, yes. <laughs> Okay, um, oh, we've got a few new ones sitting in the queue. Uh, as ATAs would connect to central SBCs, can you provide some tips to simplify routing every time a new ATA gets booked up? I think, I think we sort of answered that before with uh, Active Directory or um, you could use the route server as well. Audio Codes has a product for that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So there's 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 kind of lots of answers, but obviously it helps to kind of get the answers sort of simplified to a certain extent. So um, I get the first answer I, I would say is look at the dial plan feature on, on the SPCs because that's how we automate things really. Um, so the dial plan really is a kind of relationship between a telephone number and a, and a job to do or a route to take. So you mm. can quickly build lists of telephone numbers and, and routes. So it means that you can have just one or two routes in the SPC which feed into a dial plan. So when you add a new ATA, um, it's just added kind of automatically almost in, into the um, uh, into the SPC. As you said, we also do have a, a, a tool or application called the Audio Codes Routing Manager, which, which does help. It's usually only on quite large installations um, that, that we use it. It's uh, it's pretty expensive to be fair, but it works very effectively. Uh, but you can also build your own versions with that. So the, the SPCs can also do kind of HTTP lookups. So you can build out quite a simple web services platform where you basically just got a kind of web server. And when the call comes into the SPC, it just sends off a, a, an HTTP or REST call off to this application saying, what do I do with this call? And it just sends a route back basically. So you can build your own kind of routing engines uh, very easily as well. So there's lots of ways of extending the functionality of the SPCs, but for most cases, just use the dial plan that's built in and that will help you to do most things.
Uh, if you need any further questions, just just ping me or one of my colleagues uh, if you're not in the UK, and uh, you know we can help you talk through that quite easily. All right, Paul. Last two, uh, last the same last one is not really a question. It's just a clarification. Uh, FYI on facts, I found it quite reliable over skip to a fact server ATA when the number of pages is low. I had a law form, a law firm that um, had a law firm where they sent huge documents via fax, super efficient, and this did some have some reliability problems. Mm. But for standard one or two sheet faxes, it tends to be okay. Yeah, um, that's a good, good point. Definitely. I used, yeah. I used to work for a company called Dialogic that did a lot of fax, and it is very true that you know a couple <laughs> of pages is good, but 50 pages is bad, basically. So yes, good, very yeah. good point. Yeah, yeah, and, and I totally agree with you on that as well. Um, I've used that Dialogic's connector more than once, and then yeah. yeah, when you feed it 50 pages, it really didn't like it. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Last question, and then we'll have to head over to the breakout, but uh, that looks like it's everything. Um, are there any plans to support Spectralink deck systems uh, in audio kids SBCs? Uh, absolutely, yeah. No, we have a technology relationship with Spectralink actually, where we've kind of certified their, their decked base stations against our SBCs. So again, we have an application note on that. Um, it's uh, it's on our website, but if you can't find it, just drop me an email, um, and um, then I will I'll, I'll point you to it. But basically, most of the Spectralink phones have a base station, and the base station sends out voice over IP. So they basically we can attach them like we can the ATAs or, or SIP phones, so we can use the mm. SIP register and everything. So it works really well. And I said we, we do have a certified relationship with Spectralink because they're, they're a good vendor in this market. Um, so yeah, ping me and I will send you the PDF and it gives you full detail on how to make it work. Sounds like a plan. It sounds like you're going to make that person really happy. Okay, <laughs> well, that's it for this session. Thank you everyone for coming along. I have posted a link to the breakout session uh, in the chat if you'd like to uh, join us and keep the conversation going. I'm going to head it over there. Otherwise, we hope you're enjoying the rest of the comms first. Thank you yep. very much. Thanks, Lever. Speak soon. Cheers. Thanks, James. I'll nip over there now, Ken. Okay? See you in a second. Yeah, sure. Okay, cheers. <laughs>